everyone. I would like to welcome you to the WIFPICS Taking Stock of Pediatric ICU Pediatric Needle Natal Nursing webinar uh, to celebrate the year of the nurse. What we have done here is organize a group of nurses from around the world to have a tabletop discussion um, answering questions as they see them from their side of the world. We have representation from around the world and we are gonna go ahead and start um, with our first questions. But in, before we do that quickly, um, if you have questions, um, there's an opportunity to use the Q&A box and we will, uh, um, I will be moderating and I will um, ask your questions as I see them come through. By way of introduction, my name is Lauren Source. I am the Vice President for Nursing for the World Federation. And again, I welcome all of you today. So from uh, Europe, representing Europe, we have uh, Dr. Joseph Manning. If you could wave, Joseph, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, Joseph is the Vice Chair of Ethnic Nursing Science Section. He's a charge nurse in the pediatric CCOT at Nottingham Children's Hospital and Neonatology, Nottingham University Hospitals of the NHS Trust, School of Health Sciences, the University of Nottingham in the UK. From North America, we have Lori Lee, who's in Canada. Lori, if you can wave, thank you. She's a pediatric nurse practitioner in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at Alberta Children's Hospital in Calgary, Canada. Also from North America, we have Courtney Nirovich. Courtney, can you wave, please? She's from the US. She's a clinical nurse in the Lovkovsky Family Pediatric Intensive Care Unit um, at Lurie Children's in Chicago, and she's a founding member of the Nursing Ethics Forum in Chicago. Um, we're just gonna keep introducing everybody and then we'll get to our first question. Uh, we have Patricia Corten Roja from Brazil. Hi, Patricia. She's a lecturer nursing and on the postgraduate nursing course, the Department of Nursing at the Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina. Uh, mm, let's just say in Brazil. <laughs> um, we also have um, from the Caribbean, we have Marissa Singh from Guyana. She's a nurse manager, Marissa. Marissa does not have her camera and that's fine. Um, she's the, P uh, there you are. Can you wave please, Marissa? She is the Pediatric Surgical and Pediatric Critical Care Unit in Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation in Georgetown, Guyana. From Asia, in Singapore, we have Po Pei Fen. There you are. Um, she is the Assistant Clinical Nurse Clinician and ECMO Nurse Specialist Division of Nursing at the KK Women and Children's Hospital in Singapore. From Africa, we have Natasha North. Natasha, there you are. She's a senior research officer at the Harry Crossley Children's Nursing Development Unit, the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health in the UCT Children's Hospital in Cape Town, South Africa. Also from Africa, we have Mosetsi uh, Makwatsi is the Operation Manager for Surgery at the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital in Johannesburg. Uh, where are you? Did you wave to us? No, you have your camera off. That's okay. Um, also from Europe, we have Rachel Morrison from the UK as an advanced nurse practitioner. Hi, Rachel. She's a pediatric intensive care unit and, and kids intensive care and decision support neonatal transfer service at Birmingham Children's Hospital, the NHS Foundation Trust in the Birmingham, UK. Um, from Oceana, we have Fenella Gill. She's in Australia. She's an associate professor for acute pediatric nursing at the School of Nursing, Midwifery and Paramedicine at Curtin University and Perth Children's Hospital in Perth, Australia. Fenella, did you wait for us? Sorry if I missed it. Um, also from Asia, we have um, Manjinder Kaur from India, an infection control nursing officer and postgraduate um, Institute of Medical Education and Research uh, in Chandakar, India. Thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate all of your time, recognizing it's a different time of day everywhere across the world. Some of you joining us very early in the morning, starting your day and early in the morning, ending your day. So we are gonna start with the first question. And this question um, is for Europe and North America. Um, what strategy should we take to encourage nurses to choose pediatric ICU nursing as a profession? 
So Joseph, why don't we start with you? Sure, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to join this webinar today. So I think as the chair of the nursing science section uh, for the European Society for Paediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care, what we've done is we've tried to reach out to our um, partners, our, our members, um, and you know we cover a large geographical expanse in Europe with lots of different healthcare systems um, and different ways in which we organise and configure care and also in different ways in which nurses are trained and recognised. And, and from those discussions, particularly from the UK, Netherlands, Germany, Ireland um, and Belgium, is that we've identified that salary and status is important. So I think that would encourage people into PICU or NICU nursing is about having, um, you know, rewarding people financially um, for the skills and, and, the, and the contribution that they make in caring for the most vulnerable, critically ill children or infants. I think the other thing that's come across is around careers and career progression and having very clear career pathways. And across Europe, there are many differences in, in the different countries in, in relation to what careers mm -hmm. or career progression is, is available for nurses. So it's about making that very explicit to within the PICU or NICU environment where nurses work, what, is, what are the opportunities available for them with regard to professional development Development or different careers that they can they can take and certainly in the UK we have opportunities and, and certainly Rachel can add to this as an, a, a, an advanced nurse practitioner but we do have advanced clinical practice pathways but as a nurse scientist we also have um, research pathways but it's about making those explicit available and accessible to all if that's a career pathway that you want to pursue. I think the other th thing that's coming out across Europe is around the working environment um, and having a working environment. And we know this because we're working in a global pandemic context is that that nurtures and enhances the well-being of staff because that will attract people in to work within that specialty. Um, and it will keep them, retain them within, within that specialty. So we need to th really think about, you know, how do we support staff? How do we enhance their well-being, um, And how do we make them stay? And, and part of that is around the structure and organisation of nursing, but also it's about the environment and how, you know, when you're working a shift, how do we look after our staff and how do we keep them within our department? Thank you, Joseph. Lori, we're going to move over to you. Same question. Again, what strategy should we take to encourage nurses to choose the PICU as a nursing profession? Thank you. So Canada um, also has large geography, but a bit more unification in terms of nursing roles and, um, and the way the profession is structured. Certainly something we've heard um, nationally is similar to what Joseph mentioned about remuneration or pay that is... Um, uh, shows the extra skill set and extra knowledge level required by nurses in intensive care units. We've struggled with that a lot in Canada because the main uh, source of employment regulation in hospitals across Canada is unionization. And so um, we've been unable successfully to be able to have remuneration for skill, knowledge and contribution outside of a few isolated hospitals. So we've really had to focus on that career path, mentorship and support within the unit. And really, pediatric and neonatal critical care units are recognized as um, positions for nurses that allow a lot of career growth and a career development through mentorship of advanced practice nurses, clinical nurse specialists, nurse practitioners, bedside research on a multidisciplinary level, and liaisons between the faculties at the nursing schools and the children's hospitals. And I think that's a really important relationship that we've been working to foster in different PICUs across Canada with really engaging the academics with the bedside practitioners. And physicians have done that well traditionally, and I think nursing, specifically intensive care nursing, can do better with that in Canada, certainly, to really bridge those connections, which allows nurses to have more opportunities and more breadth of a career. And when you're trying to attract individuals into a high stress, high knowledge, high skill set area like intensive care for children and neonates, I think having those relationships with academia can really show how much development and career development is possible um, for those individuals. And I think the type of people that are attracted to intensive care want to be able to grow their careers and, and grow themselves as they move forward. And that's one of the ways we've been successful without being able to pay 
more for intensive care to our staff is to provide career opportunities for them. Um, the one other thing I wanted to mention is um, we have at our hospital and now at three other children's hospitals across Canada implemented rigorous critical incident stress management programs. Um, and this speaks more to the support of ongoing staff, but it's something that we discuss for staff coming in as well in recognizing the moral distress that comes with working in a lot of these environments and having a proactive approach to managing that for our staff. And I think that's important as younger generations appropriately focus more on good work-life balance if we want to invite them into our world, which is exciting and interesting, um, but also challenging and sad and can be emotionally difficult, is to recognize up front that we provide supports for those staff to manage through and build their resilience in a stressful environment. Great, thank you, Lori. We're gonna move over to Courtney to um, wrap up the European and North American perspective. What strategies should we take to encourage nurses to choose the PICU as their nursing profession? Go ahead, Courtney. Thank you. Um, in my perspective, I think early on in um, my academics, there is this group of people that either loved pediatrics and other group that wanted nothing to do with pediatrics. And at my university, the big portion was to push the people that wanted pediatrics and give them exposure to all the different types of pediatrics out there. Um, when I did my clinicals, it was at a very small unit. There was maybe four or five pediatric beds. There was no intensive care unit, so I didn't have that much exposure when I was at my university. However, I did an internship, and when I had an internship at uh, Chicagoland Hospital, I really got that exposure to see what pediatric critical care entailed, and that it wasn't just, you know, seeing the few asthmatics um, on a cannula. So I think giving our young nurses the exposure is the biggest um, push to really get them to choose pedi pediatric critical care. Um, prior to the pandemic at Lurie Children's, we had a couple of different things set in place. Um, we would have nurses come through our unit as interns where they would be able to see um, how the unit works, how it's structured, the type of patients that we saw. We also have um, nursing students that would do what's called a capstone, um, which is their very last clinical in university where they choose one specialty. And these nurses had been exposed to the PICU. They showed interest, so they take an entire semester and do their studies directly in the PICU. And a lot of these students are the ones that we want to onboard. Um, after they graduate. So we know that they have a passion for it. They want to be there. They've been exposed to it. So we really put um, effort into getting those nurses to try to apply and to choose um, our institution and to work into the PICU. Um, the other thing that we also really do is our, um, a lot of our certified nursing assistants um, are also in school. So we know that these are nurses that, again, have seen the PICU that know the work that we do and we really try to push these nurses as well to um, choose the PICU once they finish schooling and once they graduate. So a lot of it is internal, um, trying to get our nurses that are already there, but then also being in a big city in Chicago, um, we're connected to the other universities as well. So a lot of those nurses get to have the exposure and come do their clinicals at, at Lurie's. So. Thank you. We have heard um, big broad picture down to unit specific for North America and Europe. So we're going to shift our focus now. Um, just one minute. We have um, Evelyn, someone saying that they cannot hear us. I don't know if there's um, something you can help with on the back end to help that. Um, if everyone could make sure that their connections, um, every, all the attendees can make sure their connections are solid. Um, because I don't know if anyone else is having trouble hearing, I can um, hear the panelists. Um, so thank you. Um, so we're gonna shift over to a different part of the world now um, and ask the same question. We're gonna go to Latin America. We're gonna ask Patricia um, to speak to what strategies we can take to encourage nurses to choose um, PICU or pediatric critical care nursing as their chosen profession. Patricia? Hi, everybody. Thank you to invite me for this webinar. 
And in Latin America, we have been, have many problems to deal with in pediatrics and neonatology. Just a minute. Such as an insufficient number of professionals, insufficient number, number of ICU beds, often requiring facilities, inadequate training and support, curricular disagreements, social discrepancy, primary health problems, low wages, few scholarships, few professors specialized in pediatrics and neonatology. And in the next 10 years, one, one out of six nurses will retire in the Americas. At the same time, many children have increasingly complex and diverse health care needs. In addition, mental health disorders and suicide in childhood occur earlier and more frequently. Finally, racial, ethnic and socioeconomic disparities in children's health and healthy care are persistent. Then some strategies are necessary to begin in change in intergraduate pediatric education as follows to have a standardized curriculum with a minimum of previously established hours for both theoretical and practical course, to have a practical experience during undergraduate nursing education can shape the joys of becoming a profession in this field. These students need adequate exposure to a priority of a practical pediatric environment to encourage the students to participate in research in a field of pediatrics and neonatology, individually or as a member in a research group, to encourage students to undertake community work and extracurricular internships. In addition, there is an increasing number of refugees, so there is a need to prepare future nurses to take care of emotional babies children and adolescents with different backgrounds who came from countries that face social and economic problems, to have access to new technologies, to show the students what they should know about pediatric nurses day to day. Marta Cooley emphasized it's necessary that students understand the nurses' competences especially in pediatric and neonatology, so it's necessary to explain to them clinical judgment, advocacy, moral agency, caring practices, facilitation of learning, collaboration, system think, response to diversity, and the clinical inquiry. Now I would, li I would like to talk about other strategies to improve the income, because the nurse's salary average in Brazil is 500 American dollar months, then it's too low. To have pediatrics and nurses and neonatologists as leaders in hospitals, governments, universities, and etc. To have both private and public funding for research in the field of pediatrics and neonatology. To encourage nurses to pursue a master and a PhD by offering a career plan to increase the number of number specializations and the residences in both areas, mainly intensive care units, to teach students to conduct research using data and to randomize clinical trials, society, associations, and colleges of nursing speci specialists in pediatric and neonatology need to create strategy, such as campaign, campaigns to encourage nurses to become a pet ICU nurse, to create institutional policies to encourage career development plan for professionals experts. And the last, but not the least, we need to change the rate of nurses patients in Latin America. For instance, in Brazil, in intensive care units, the number is one nurse for eight beds and one technician for two patients. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, those are staggering numbers. Um, we are going to move on to Marissa Singh from the Caribbean. Marissa, are you ready? Go ahead, you can unmute yourself. Hi, good morning, 
everyone. I'm happy to be presenting this morning. Um, one of the ways to encourage, well, if we want to encourage nurses to choose pediatrics, pediatric neonatal, um, neonatal nursing and pediatric ICU, then we must be able to give them access to the tools they need to help guide them in that, in that direction, such as delivery of structured training programs, development programs, such as setting up nurse residency programs, offer continuous nursing education courses, um, workshops to encourage stimulation and critical thinking exercises. These are definitely ways to provide opportunities for nurses to build in their competencies and their confidence and engage them in pediatric nursing. And this is certainly something that is lacking in my country. Um, apart from the neonatal intensive care program, there are no other structured pediatric program offered in Guyana. And as a result, nurses are apprehensive or even reluctant to work in the pediatric departments. At our PICU, we do conduct training sessions um, very um, to participate. And some of them have been molded pediatric critical care team and others have joined the general pediatrics. However, nurses are still Marissa, I'm sorry, we're having trouble hearing you. There you go, try again. Hello? Hi, sorry, <laughs> sorry you were frozen sorry. there for a second. Um, another strategy that we take in our country is that we allow nurses to rotate in different um, clinical departments throughout the hospitals, and this allows nurses to gain exposure to different clinical settings and helps them to decide which specialty they want to pursue. Um, in our department, nurses from the general pediatric unit who are of top talent or show potential um, for critical care are given the opportunity to rotate in our pediatric critical care unit for a period of three to six months. And during that period, um, they're being engaged in bedside simulation exercises and bedside teaching and allowed to give supervised care to effort to motivate them towards choosing pediatric critical care. And this method has definitely proven a little helpful, um, encouraging nurses to join our critical care team. And we've been able to retain um, some of our nurses post rotations. Another thing that we find um, that it helps to encourage nurses join um, our pediatric team is that we allow for flexible schedules. Um, we initially, our institution had a three hour shift sh um, system, um, which led to burnout and sick days and absenteeism and nurses were unable because nurses were unable, opted for a 12 hour shift system which allowed nurses more flexibility in working shifts um, that were giving them this opportunity to select their shifts nurses were more cooperative they seem more definitely help us to retain some of the nurses in our department and in general, in encouraging nurses to join um, pediatrics or neonatal nursing or PICU is basically to promote the specialties, um, utilize media platforms or utilize social media to get the message out there. We can create websites and microsites to um, provide details about each specialty, outlining what are some of the benefits, what are the, um, the opportunities for career advancements. Um, we can have details on criteria for each specialty just to encourage them and give them an area of these. Additionally, everybody uses social media. So utilize the social media platform to promote and share information about the various pediatric specialties, have discussions, share journals, videos, lectures, and information and webinars about each of the pediatric specialty. And hopefully this will engage and encourage persons to join pediatrics. I think that's all for me. Thank you, Marissa. Um, we're going to move continents. We're going to go over to Asia. And we would like to hear from you, Pope Pei Fen, uh, from Singapore. Um, what I'm, strategies are being used by you guys? Um, so um, thank you for having us. And uh, Marissa, it's nice to hear that uh, you guys have actually swapped from three shift to 12 hours. I would actually like to hear more about the 12 hour shift because it's still a current debate in our unit. Um, Singapore is a small country. We have a population of, of about 
6 million only, and there are only a total of about 24 pediatric ICU beds in the country for public health. Um, so the truth is pediatric nursing is often uh, oversubscribed by the fresh graduate, but the PICU nursing still remains as a niche and a mystical area. So in terms of um, exposure to for the new nurses, um, we have both arms. Um, in terms of clinical exposure, we do job rotations also. So fresh graduates get rotated uh, for about a year and that's where they get a taste of ICU. So that has been our main go-to for exposure. In terms of research, we work with the undergrad nursing students to carry out um, PICU related nursing research. So that's how the research arm um, um, get the exposure. But uh, with the recent COVID, we realized that there's a speed up in exposure because of the design of the unit. We actually planned to keep the current ICU as a clean area and we would quarantine or isolate our PICU um, patients in another unit. So because of the setup, the general ward nurses and the high nurses actually get work. We work together because we house the ICU patients, high dependency patient and the general patient in the same isolation ward. So that's how the nurses get together and then when they get exposure to our PICU uh, patients. In terms of keeping them, the, the new nurses in the ICU, I think it's very much on a micro uh, interpersonal level where we have to sort of flatten the learning curve because um, we have actually get very much feedback from our nurses that it's, it's very tough to be a, a, a beginner in the ICU. So flattening the curve would be one and also to give them a sense of belonging. Um, but I foresee that in terms of the career track is it's still not very clear in Singapore. So currently, to to be we, there's no specialty as a pediatric intensive care nurse. So the advanced diploma we call the specialized diploma would be you can either choose to be specialized in pediatrics or in critical care. In terms of the master's degree, um, nurses can specialize in pediatrics. We have our very first APN in the ICU and uh, we're still trying to find out what's the track going to be. And uh, of course, we very much would like to have a master's degree in a pediatric ICU care. So that's from Singapore. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to move continents again, and we're going to go to Africa. So Natasha, we will uh, start with you in Africa. Thank you, Lauren, um, and thanks so much for inviting us to be part of things today. Um, most of you can probably tell from my accent that I didn't start out in Africa, um, but I'm going to comment from our perspective, um, running one of Africa's, um, Southern and Eastern Africa's only two training programs for pediatric critical care nursing. Um, so there's us down at the pointy end of Africa at the University of Cape Town. And there's also great work being done by colleagues at Gertrude's Children's Hospital in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, but to the best of our knowledge in Southern and Eastern Africa, that's it. Um, so you can imagine that the, the nursing numbers um, within the, the Peds Creek Care specialty are still incredibly, incredibly low. Um, and that's really what I want to bring through into addressing this issue, um, is what is the reality for a nurse who is entering pediatric critical care as a career move um, on the continent of Africa, given the capacity and the resources. I am frequently struck by the burden of responsibility on trainees who will come to us in the full knowledge that 12 months on, they are going to be returning to their unit potentially as the only peds crit care nurse, um, the, the only nurse with, with, a, with a recognized qualification. So they will say through the duration of their training, I've got to concentrate, I've got to take notes because I know when I go back, I have to teach my colleagues everything that I have learned here. And I think, I mean, I have the utmost respect for the nurses who take on that responsibility um, and who return as leaders um, in their units and their facilities. But at the same time, it's not a sustainable path for growing high quality pediatric critical care on our continent. Um, Joseph, you talked about the need to, to, um, to uphold well-being, and Laurie recognised the, the very high-stress environment um, of paediatrics. Um, 
And I think that that is also key to retaining nurses um, within the specialty. And in our context, what that means is the need to build strong and sustainable teams so that nurses are not expected to operate as the sole specialty clinician, um, that they can be part of a sensibly resourced team that is capable of delivering appropriate ratios um, of, of staff to patients. And we understand totally that that ratio will look very different in Africa than it does in other environments. Um, and there are lots of other things about the way that care is organized too that are very different. Um, but those, those two things I think would, would go a long way. So it's about seeing training and building a sustainable workforce um, as part of a much more clustered approach to building capacity um, and doing all that we can to support the nurses um, who, who are willing to take on that, that real responsibility. For us as well, that it's increasingly an issue. We're enormously encouraged to see the growth of new PICUs um, throughout the continent. A lot of this is donor driven. Um, and I think we need to recognize that Africa sometimes has a bit of a savior problem. And PICU occasionally, I hope I'm allowed to say this, but we sometimes have a little bit of a hero problem. Um, and you put those two things together and things can move really, really quickly. And so we get requests to accept trainees from units that are open, um, but have no trained nurses. Um, so it's just a plea for that process of building the workforce to start well in advance, like before the first trench is dug and the first brick is laid, we've got to be thinking not just will we have the beds, will we have the, the ventilators, will we have the nurses? Um, I'm going to hand over to Muso um, to, to talk about South Africa, right? Muso, I tried to um, I tried to cover the Africa piece, but um, but back to Lauren. Great, thank you. And hand off we go to Muse. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Natasha. Um, so, uh, so strategies uh, and, and and one of the one of the challenges that we. We, we, we have is that um, training, um, so in PQ and, 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 and new NICU, uh, to some extent, um, according to in, in South Africa, it was, it was meshed together, but NICU was taken into the advanced midwifery. Uh, it was advan advanced midwifery with new NATE. And um, you only have uh, Natasha in, um, the Harry Crossley uh, Children's uh, Nurses Development Unit, who were the sole provider of child critical care training. And the, that divide um, uh, sort of posed a challenge. So one of the strategies will really, um, you know, like um, they do at CNDU to merge pediatrics and uh, to change the mindset that new nature are also pediatrics. Uh, that would be quite uh, critical. People uh, sometimes um, take for granted the, the value of mentorship. Um, I've had many cases whereby you get um, undergrad students allocated into uh, the NICU or PQ, and um, we don't have a structured, um, a purposeful mentor, mentorship as to how do we, when this nest get out of here in three months or in four months, uh, how have we impacted on, 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 on this nurse clinician? And that is the challenge. So one of the strategies will be, we need to, to have purposeful mentorship. Uh, sometimes it becomes difficult when you are the only senior um, um, nurse with um, uh, five new nurses in ICU and out of five, you are having four ventilators and you are having also the responsibility of having to, to mentor the, the, the the, the new or novice nurses. So having a structured, a purposeful mentorship program, both in PQ and NICU, that will, grow, that will go a long way in ensuring that we attract these nurses to, to these two areas. Um, and that is in part going to be also be um, facilitated by how we as senior nurse clinicians uh, 
carry ourselves in, in both these units. If we carry ourselves in a manner that is um, um, not okay, um, we are going to be projecting the image that we don't want uh, this nurses to be coming back and projecting in these units. The other strategy is actually um, also a formulation of um, or coming up with uh, strategies or platforms where you know, there's continuous learning in these units, even though they are there for a limited period of time. Coming up with strategies like having a general uh, club discussions on numerous uh, topics that, has, that, 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 that are relevant to PQ and NICU, um, I found that to be very um, useful. And um, at the end of those rotation, then you get, um, you've converted out of five, you've converted four, Nest clinicians who shows a, quite an interest in pediatric ICU and neonatal ICU at the same time. But with that, you've also, um, I think it was Courtney who was saying that you've got to provide them with the resources. And there are numerous resources are also available for free. So encouraging them uh, to, know, to, to register uh, on platforms like uh, Chifa, like uh, partaking in the discussion that are happening there, you know, affiliating to the healthy uh, newborn network, uh, because there's quite a rich uh, resources that is available then. What I've noticed um, in my current um, hospital is that we've implemented a strategy called competency framework in that every new um, nurses that get appointed in in, in, in any capacity, PQ, NICU, we, we, we have what we call a competency workbook whereby they purposefully work with somebody in the first six months, um, a clinical nurse specialist who will carry them uh, so that they can complete their, their competency book at the, at, the, at the end of the six month period. And that has worked quite well in terms of uh, imparting skills on these nurses. And in a South African context, we need to come up with a standardized norms and standard as to how we are going to have a nurse patient ratio in our neonatal ICU and a pediatric ICU because at the moment um, it's hospital to hospital and um, without that uniformity you find out different hospitals are doing different things um, and the unavailability of standardized and norms and standards in terms of nurse patient ratio in the country um, that creates a challenge and having a standardized norms and standard will go a long way in attracting also uh, these new nurses uh, into, the, into this, um, these spheres. Um, and the other things that I found very useful is um, utilizing a framework on reflection, you know, um, encouraging these new nurse clinicians that, you know, at the end of the day, when you get home, try and reflect on how your day was, document it, if you are safe, come and share it with the rest of the group so that we evaluate if whether learning has taken place. And I will pause there with regards to some of the strategies that will go a long way in, attra in attracting nest clinicians into the uh, pediatric ICU and neonatal ICU. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are going to change questions now. I do see that there's a couple of comments in the Q&A and we'll get to those. Um, at the end, we'll um, be able to talk a little bit more. Um, so we're going to go back to Europe with Rachel, and we're going to ask the question, what is being done to retain nurses in the PICU? Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for having me. And I was thinking firstly of why this um, question is so important. Um, and I guess at my trust, they talk a lot about it being the best place to be cared for for the patients. But I kind of like to flip that. I think if you can make it the best place to be cared for for the staff, then you'll absolutely get the best patient care. And I think there's lots of evidence for that. And then it really stuck with me at the Singapore with PICS that they talked about a Boston study, which showed if you have more than 20 percent of your nurses with less than two years experience, then actually your mortality figures will start to be affected. So in terms of retaining nurses, for me, that was a real strong point that sat in my head. And then about 18 months ago in the UK, we did a large um, national survey and lots of people have talked about well-being today. So we surveyed and I think we got about 1,200 responses from the nurses. 
And actually what, what it we surveyed was the psychological distress levels. And it showed us that nurses um, suffer much more with moral distress than our medical colleagues do. And there's been a couple of papers from um, Gillian Colville and Larson, which have really talked about um, the nurses struggle with their lack of power at the bedside and being having to do care that they don't necessarily agree with. Um, I don't, from when I started in PICU, the, the care we give and how long we keep people alive has vastly changed. And also our culture and parental expectations have grown massively. So that was one of the areas. The, the study also showed us that about 30% of our nurses are at risk of PTSD. So that, that is a huge amount. And also showed us around um, burnout, that about 46% of the nurses were at risk of emotional exhaustion, burnout. And it's interesting when you hear the people like Liz Crow from Australia talk about burnout. She tells me there are 55,000 papers wrote on burnout and we know absolutely zero about what to do about it. So um, I suppose I have a big plea in that we should um, have a moral duty to stop measuring it now and start doing something about it. So we've, we've managed to form a national group within the UK now looking at well-being. Within the unit at Birmingham, we've looked at, we've actually just started a study called SWELL. So we're trying to audit all the well-being interventions we're giving for the nurses and actually work out what's the psychological basis for those and how well are they accessed. Because it's fine if we've just put in lots of stuff on, but it's not accessed. And then we're doing some um, interviews around to try and explore when people have had a challenging experience around well-being. And that could have gone really well or not gone so well. And we're trying to explore actually um, get some more information that so we can start to actually put interventions in place and also work on the outcome measures. How will we measure these interventions? So I think all this well-being stuff really goes to look, looking after our staff to keep them working and keep them healthy in ITU. And I suppose we just talk about the, a little bit about the Birmingham experience. So about a year ago, we probably had a reasonable problem. So around nationally, um, turnover is around 12% um nationally it's a, it was 22 percent in our unit we knew we we're at more risk because the national study showed us once you're a bigger unit above 15 beds you're at more risk so there's some things that we did locally that um actually don't cost lots of money and are actually been really helpful so when we did a national survey of resources we found only eight percent eighty percent of eight percent of units actually taught about self-care and we absolutely know in well-being you have to be able to self-care so if anyone gets on a plane ever again and with COVID, they tell you to put your ox own oxygen mask on first. And we needed to help our nurses learn how to look after themselves. So we, we talk a lot to them about connection, forming relationships. Forming relationships is absolutely key. We talk a lot about helping them to find meaning and actually some of the nurses to retain them, helping them to think about why did they come to this job? What's the meaning in, in for it? And there's massive meaning in our work. We use um, an initiative called Learning for Excellence, and that's that's on the internet. You can look at their website for free. It, it started in Birmingham, but it's used across the UK now. And that's all about trying to look learn from what went well. So we know that we can show our value our staff by actually saying you did this well. What we do know is you have to be quite specific in that feedback. So it's really helpful when we say to our staff, you were really good when you spoke to that parent, you gave them lots of space to talk. And we know that we can, we've shown we can improve practice by that and actually it makes people feel good and valued and appreciated. We, we, just, we haven't quite got it right yet, but we're just trying to set up different models of peer support. And probably within the evidence base, there's a lot about peer support, helping well-being, and that helps retain staff. Um, I think people have touched on it a lot about actually education and I suppose we absolutely knew you can do lots of stuff for the leaders but a bit like when you've got a beehive the queen bee can't run it all it has to be the worker bees that are doing it so we really want to grow and develop our staff and this doesn't mean um, promotion or those sorts of things necessarily it can just be growing them in their own roles and giving them the tools and so we wrote some developmental pathways so everybody could see them everyone has equitable access to education it wasn't the person shouting the loudest um, we absolutely know that we need to give them in, um, in time for engagement so very much keeping the open door policy we very much have done learn listening events creative things like spaces for listening 
where people have got time just to reflect and talk to colleagues about the challenges of PIC. And I suppose what I believe is that if we improve the well-being for staff and nurses, we will actually keep them, retain them. Um, and then just finally to mention, there's quite a lot of free resources you can get. So there's things like the Learning for Excellence site, which has got lots of stuff on. I know the SMIC site has got some um, videos on from Ellie Atkins, which is a psychologist talking um, about that. The St Emlyn's podcast has got lots of the Liz Crow work on and you can tap into her podcast. And then also um, in the UK, the adult world is ahead of us. And particularly with COVID, because they've been so hard hit, there's been lots of resource put into looking after the adult ICU staff. So if you go into the um, UK Intensive Care Society, you'll see lots of Julie Highfield's work and there's loads of free resources within that. So that's just some things you could tap into if you wanted. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Fanella, we're going to move over to you from your perspective in Oceana. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. And thanks for the chance to um, to contribute to this today. I was going to say tonight, but today for you guys. Um, so um, in Australia, I guess, um, just to give you a, a little bit of an overview, um, we have um, a very centralised model of um, um, PQ, so there are nine PQs or ten if you count um, Auckland, so we talk about Australasia. And so um, that has a real impact on, on the workforce, it's not as if there's another PQ down the road. So from a point of view of retaining nurses, that's really important. And then from um, the training perspective, we have a totally registered nurse workforce, in fact a bachelor prepared workforce. Um, and there are structured programs from entry, so from beginning um, entry to in the big queue to wards, um, usually after a year or so of experience into postgraduate study, which um, is at um, a number of levels, starting at a graduate certificate and then up to a master's level. So there are very structured programs available. We also have, we do have, and we feel, feel like we're just the opposite of what we've been hearing about in Africa because we do have standards for both um, workforce for ratios and for the proportion of nurses who have a PQ or a critical care qualification. The, the standard is at least 50% of your workforce. But saying that, um, I did just check um, in, in preparation for the day and at the moment our, our um, percentage is 38%. And that is an ongoing issue because we need to retain our workforce. Um, and we know that um, the work that's been done many years ago really shows that the, the cycle of um, nurses who um, work in, in critical care is around five years. So you really do need to be preparing nurses because we know that they are gonna leave the workforce. So I did ask, um, I did a, a bit of an informal survey also um, in preparation to today to ask um, the other um, states. I'm in Western Australia on, on one side of Australia and then um, I, I have had input from um, uh, others from the other states and also from um, Auckland about what, what, um, what are the initiatives or what things are being done to retain nurses. And um, the, um, in summary, so um, I'm, I wasn't going to talk about um, in detail about specific initiatives, but um, in summary, the things that were coming out, I did my th thematic analysis of um, what everybody told us, um, really emphasizing that the, the strong leadership is key to um, retaining staff and mentoring. We've heard a bit about mentoring already and having a strong and positive team and the positive culture being key. And I know um, there are certainly some examples of some of the units in Australia where that's been a problem and they've had, um, then put in place um, specific initiatives to, to, to turn that around, to change that. We know that um, it's also been um, mentioned has been the challenge of um, wishing to reward nurses for the, the work they do in critical care, but being um, limited by the award conditions that it's not possible for to be paid um, at a higher rate. But other initiatives um, um, such as qualification allowance, so rewarding those who do have a postgraduate qualification um, with an extra, um, an extra few dollars in their 
salaries. Um, parking, uh, car parking is always a challenge. And then we're, we're in a brand new hospital and that was a real um, stress for staff because unless you're working um, night shift, pretty much, or, or evening shifts, if you're working day shifts, then there, there was no, no, no parking. So um, being able to provide parking <laughs> is um, a way to, to make work conditions improved. And I think that, that sort of section about working conditions is, um, is, is worth noting that if um, um, nurses are happy with their roster and they um, can park and they can um, have a good environment to work in, that, that's, that's key, like a baseline starting point. Then for education support, um, I've talked about there is opportunity for postgraduate study, but that isn't without a cost. And so that's something that the employer can um, support with um, uh, paid leave, say, to, to attend study and to um, have some sort of um, arrangement with the universities to actually um, pay for some of the fees and um, enable nurses to, to, to participate in, in the education that's the, the, particularly the, the structured postgraduate education. Um, that's always a bit of a challenge in, in, the, in the context of PICU because um, they're small um, units overall so um, there's a, a limit to how many nurses at one time can actually be undertaking postgraduate study because that means they need more support, they need to be able to attend lectures, they need to um, be able to um, uh, achieve the assessments and so it's not as if it's an endless number of people who can um, undertake study at one time and then that's always a balance then with the universities and that's been my experience um, before I worked um, in the last few years more in research would be the, the viability of the, of the courses for PICU. Um, I didn't talk about that um, we really do consider that NICU is, is a different specialty so um, I'm really um, talking only about PICU, I mean I can probably answer questions about NICU if people are interested. Um, career development is something that is a real problem um, um, or a reason why people do leave um, um, the PICU, so we, we prepare um, critical thinkers who are leaders who have undertaken postgraduate qualifications and um, then um, there is no career progression for them or li limited anyway so um, it's a real bottleneck and, and that's probably the same where, where we all work is that um, the, the, the um, experts the specialists who are looking after the sick children who are coordinating the shifts and then there's nowhere for them to go for career development so um, there have been some initiatives, of course, there's nurse practitioner roles and other advanced practice roles, but it's not, um, it's not enough for everybody. And, and, and that does mean that um, our really great nurses who I feel proud of helping to have help prepare along their journey, they're now um, take, taking up other leadership roles in the hospital or, or beyond rather than staying at the bedside. So that's, that's a real challenge and uh, it'd be interesting whether people have got solutions to that. So there have been a number of new roles being created in, in our hospital recently um, and that's of course been great for a few people but um, if people get into a really good job that they like and you, you probably feel think of that yourself then, um, then then they're not moving on um, and particularly I've just sort of indicated there's not other PICUs and um, certainly say in Western Australia, you've got to go a long way to go somewhere else to work. So people do stay put when they do get a good job. Um, other things that um, I heard from um, the other states in particular, but also here in Western Australia, where that was about the focus on, on well-being. And we've heard a little bit, um, uh, well, a lot in fact from Rachel, so I won't, I won't um, just repeat what, what the things that she's been talking about, but a number of the initiatives that are as I've talked about as well about um, peer support and um, building the team morale and social um, social care or staff friendly initiatives to really um, reward and recognise and, and support each other. That's been um, been um, really um, been a, a key thing that's come from all of the all of the states. So thanks for that, and yeah, happy to to ask, answer any questions if there's anything else I can help with. Thanks, Vanilla. We are going to move to Asia and ask the same question. 
what are you guys doing to retain nurses? We're going to go with uh, Hope Hey Fen. Yep. Um, so on the national level, um, about five years back, we formed a national nursing task force. And um, nationally, they came up with a few strategies to retain nurses in Singapore. So uh, first and foremost, the economic factor. Um, there was an adjustment of pay increment, the basic salary for about 3 to 10%. They've improved the work environment for nurses in terms of the nurse-patient ratio. There are also more opportunities in terms of upskilling the nurses. There are more scholarships for degree and masters of nursing. And um, there are more, in, from the clinical point of view, there are more awareness on nurses' well-being and the burnout also. We're just uh, starting out. So it's interesting to hear from Rachel about nurses' burnout. We realize that when we talk about burnout in the ICU, there's a lot of focus on the individual nurses, um, the things that they should do and if they are doing. But um, as I was reading, I happened to chance upon the top five reasons for burnout. There are actually two arms. So we have the nurses arm and we have the employee arm, the system arm. So the top five reasons would be unfair treatment at work, unmanageable workload, lack of role clarity, lack of communication and support from their manager, and unreasonable time pressure. I think to overcome this, we need a systematic approach to manage this burnout. So instead of just uh, focusing on the individual nurse to do their duty to take care of themselves. And I also agree with uh, Fenella about um, the sense of belonging because nurses who actually stay on to do the tough work of pediatric nursing, um, stay on because of the job satisfaction and also the self-actualization. So I think we can continue to promote that. And I think that are some of the ways that we can keep these very specialized nurses to take care of our very vulnerable group of patients. Yeah. Thank you. Majinder, we're going to move over to you and ask the same question. Uh, thank you, Lauren. There is dearth of leaders who understand that critical care nurses are precious and a vital asset of any ICU. So whatever little is done in our country is on micro level. I would like to acknowledge the efforts of Professor Jashri Murlibharan in charge of our pediatric critical care unit, who is the brain as well as the driving force behind the reforms initiated in our unit. Uh, being the permanent residents of an ICU for a certain tasks like infection control, nurses are the primary drivers. Uh, we inculcated this concept as a strategy in a recent research study. Strict infection control policy was implemented through the supervision by a pediatric ICU nurse designated as infection control nurse. She was responsible to maintain good hand hygiene compliance and uh, daily assessment for need of invasive devices. These ICN uh, driven daily unit huddles were conducted in the morning shift and uh, they were uh, to apprise the whole team about the last 24 hours count of hospital acquired infections, number of children on antibiotics and uh, invasive devices, reminder for de-escalation of antimicrobials and reinforcement of hand hygiene compliance. Uh, you know, the incidence of hand hygiene um, before and after the intervention bundle uh, showed a significant decline. And in addition to that, uh, nurses in our unit, they had, uh, because they had uh, autonomy to handle uh, the infection prevention and control measures. So this empowered the nurses and gave them a sense of belongingness to the unit and increased their overall morale. And uh, then another strategy that we uh, made a part of our unit is the parental participative care. In Indian hospitals, nurses are always overloaded and forced to multitask their work. Officially or unofficially, parents are involved in the patient care activities to reduce the workload to some extent. Though parents are involved in the tasks that are uh, um, that were already performing at home, but at hospital, parents are anxious and need more information as well as support to perform the same activities in the entirely new environment. And uh, training the fearful and anxious parents to perform adequately is an arduous task. 
So to provide effective information um, and training to the attendants, we introduced a number of steps like daily morning sessions of health teaching are conducted by the nurses and uh, the attendants are introduced to various tasks they are supposed to perform to take care of their child. An information booklet is prepared for the attendants regarding the functioning of the unit and the activities they are supposed to perform while their child stay in the unit. And uh, during the initial phase of uh, hospitalization, patients are more anxious and worried about the child's disease condition and are less attentive to what is taught to them. So they need uh, repeated rounds of information to ensure that uh, the task is performed effectively. So we prepared a video and we are planning to have a continuous telecast of this video in the attendance waiting area. So whenever they get time so that they can watch this video and have better understanding what they are supposed to do. So by introducing this step um, to educate and train the attendants in our PICU, uh, the nurses are enabled to focus more on the important tasks like assessment and monitoring, preparation and administration of fluids and medications. The third strategy that I would like to discuss is uh, capacity building and hand holding of lower level of healthcare workers. For this, a collaborative integrated module for uh, pediatric acute care training was started under the stewardship of Professor Jashri Muridharan in 2017. The aim of this program is to impart skill training to the healthcare workers at the grassroots level. Nurses from our unit visit biannually to conduct workshops at ground level. And after attending those workshops, the nurses from the ground level hospitals, they visit our institute as an observer to get first-hand skill training. During their stay in our unit, our nurses mentor the grassroots levels regarding the various uh, nursing care activities they are supposed to perform at their unit levels. So we are finding this uh, as a win-win situation for both the categories of nurses. Our unit's nurses find this collaboration meaningful as they feel inspired to share their knowledge and skill. And grassroots level nurses are gaining precious skill and knowledge at a premier tertiary care health center. So this initiative has been selected as the recipient of the 2021 Innovation in Education Award by the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Um, by adopting these strategies, to some extent, we are able to build a team where each member of field recognized and works to its maximum capability. These interventions are helping to decrease the burnout and increase the job satisfaction level of nurses. These strategies adopt by our unit may not have short-term benefits, but uh, uh, we are optimistic that in the long run, we will be able to mitigate migration and retain our nurses to some extent. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are going to move now to Africa, back to Natasha um, to ask the same question. Hey, thank you, Lauren. Um, so oftentimes when we come across this issue, um, it's accompanied by that difficult term, the brain drain. Um, and so I feel like I need to distance myself from that term a little bit as I begin. Because um, it's interesting what that does to the way that we approach the topic. Um, I myself began life in Singapore. I was born there because my father was out there um, for his career. Um, my family moved to South Africa from the United Kingdom, um, primarily because of my husband's job. Um, so twice in my life, I've been an economic migrant. And what I'm conscious of is that if you look like me and you have the qualifications after your name that I have, people say, oh, you're a global citizen. Um, so it's, it's just interesting, this brain drain term. Um, the, the other thing in retaining staff um, within nursing and within nursing specialisms um, is that the, the evidence, particularly in Africa and from African researchers based here on the continent, um, puts a bit of a question mark over the extent to which um, it is really a leading drive um, of the nursing shortages that we have here. Um, the, the statistics such as they are 
um, suggests that it's it's not the the main um, problem. It's really difficult to quantify because the the nursing register record keeping um, is pretty imprecise as well. Um, but what we do know are big, big problems um, on this continent are actually underemployment. Um, so there is a, a surprisingly large portion of the nursing workforce um, in a number of countries who are not currently employed um, within nursing roles and who are certainly not currently employed within their specific fields of specialization. And that reflects resourcing um, and service capacity. Um, so if a nurse um, migrates and seeks employment um, in another country and cards on the table, I'm absolutely not going to sit in judgment over anybody for doing that. Um, to, to what extent if she was not employed um, in, in, her, in her home self health system, um, is, is that a, a net loss? Um, it's, it's really unclear. Um, other reasons, um, surveys of nurses in a number of African countries, um, Ghana, Kenya, Botswana, quite consistently report um, that a major reason for nurses who migrate and um, look for, for work abroad um, is irregular payment of their salaries or non-payment of their salaries for very extended periods of time. And that might arise in conflict situations, it might arise in severe economic downturns, sometimes it's just a chronic, chronic problem with state capacity to actually administer um, effectively across a, a relatively large health workforce. Um, so that's, that's the gloomy stuff, um, because that stuff is hard. Um, but I think that the good news is that the same strategies that would improve the, the push factors that lead to nurses seeking employment, either in other sectors or still within nursing, but overseas, um, if we can fix those, they're the same things um, that are going to contribute to better care um, for kids in PICUs in Africa as well, because they are they are the the longer term um, system wide changes um, that I think actually the year of the nurse um, is supposed to be all about um, raising the profile of. So I think if we can approach this from the point of view of trying to build an aligned strategy which looks at workforce development, which looks at training, and which looks at measures to sustainably improve um, the capacity of clinical service delivery as well, then you've actually got an environment um, in which many nurses will feel happy and willing um, to stay and to work because their work will, will have meaning, um, because it will be possible um, it won't be um, impossibly stressful and, and because their economic needs will be met and they will be able to look after themselves and look after their families and look after their patients. Um, back to you, Laurie. Thank you, Natasha. We're going to move over to um, Rosetsi to answer the same question about retaining nurses. Uh, thank you, uh, Lauren. Uh, <coughs> So in South Africa in 2007, um, specifically with regards to the public service, uh, they introduced what we call um, occupational specific dispensation. Now, what that framework did is that it uplifted a lot of nurses um, from, in terms of their, their salary scales. All of a sudden, you had somebody in 2000 and a seven who their annual salary was at 116,000 uh, per annum. Um, and subsequent to the implementation of the occupational specific dispensation, it jumped to 387,000 per annum. That was introduced in part to try and, and retain the nurses within the public, uh, within the public uh, sector. But that also brought with itself, uh, some of the challenges that uh, we currently are experiencing in that uh, some of the nurses are considered to be unemployable because they are, they, their cost to company 
uh, is quite high. So um, that brought with its own with its itself its, its own challenges. The second aspect that the South African government wanted to uh, to try and, 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 and mitigate against this was that they they entered into a gentleman's uh, agreement. I don't want to call the memorandum of, uh, of, of, of understanding or agreements because um, even though they were entered into, uh, nobody has really looked at or monitored if that has been adhered to. Because even nowadays, you still have a nurses migrating from South Africa to other, to other countries. So that a gentleman's agreement, nobody has monitored or evaluated if it was if he, if he efficient or not. What also was introduced was a number of incentives. Um, so in South Africa, we've got a health system that has got three tiers. You've got the national, and then you've got the provincial, and then you've got the district. So if you are a, a nurse specialist working at a district, um, districts will be also classified in terms of their rurality. So you'll get other deep rural uh, hospital where in um, over and above your, in your salary package, you will get an allowance called the rural allowance, which will vary between 8% of your annual income uh, to 12%. That has also um, encouraged some of the nurses to move from your more urban areas to the district hospitals where uh, their scarce skills is mostly needed. The other important aspect that was introduced was within the bargaining um, sectors wherein uh, nurses were given a platform to be represented in terms of negotiating before the government can implement a certain policy uh, that will be presented uh, around the table where representatives from the nurses and other uh, sectors will sit around to take it back to the nurses so that nurses can have an input onto that uh, document before it is finalized and implemented. That, gives the, uh, that gave the nurses a voice to some extent for their, for their uh, to voice what their recommendation is as to how um, and nurses or nursing in general should be, should be looked at. The other aspect that has really uh, taken off in the past few years has been uh, care for the mental health uh, of, the, of, the, of the nurses. A number of uh, initiatives have been introduced to ensure that nurses are supported uh, uh, with regards to mental health. Um, because just two years ago, you know, I heard about a senior nurses in the neonatal unit who um, resigned all of a sudden. And they were not looking for further employment, but they just said, you know what, I need to take a break and just go gather myself and, 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 and reevaluate. Uh, that really showed that by then we didn't have a structured mental health program to be able to assist uh, the nurses with their uh, with the uh, other issues uh, other, than, other than nursing issues. Um, and also I think at that point, we didn't really acknowledge that working in NICU and PQ is, is, is quite stressful, um, given the number of challenges that they, they are experiencing there. The other aspect that was, was introduced was that the government also sought to come up with um, other strategies in that, if you apply to go do postgrad studies in um, child critical care or, 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 or specialty, uh, you will enter into a contract in that if you go for, 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 for one year uh, at a university, when you come back, you are going to work back uh, two years to the, to the Department of Health. Um, and that as a strategy has, um, has given the Department of Health a leeway of whilst this one is saving their, their time, then there's, there's um, a cycle of continuous um, uh, improvement um, in terms of educational levels of, of the other nurses that needed to, to be brought up to, to a level where the intensive care units really, really needed. And, and in a nutshell, those are some of the strategy that the South African government uh, sought to try and and implemented to try and retain 
um, nurses um, within the uh, national or within the public health services. Thank you. Thank you all. We have heard from all areas of the world on strategies to encourage nurses to come into the PEDS ICU and then retain nurses in the PICU. And um, we're gonna go now to our list of questions, even though some of them have been answered. I just want everybody um, to have the opportunity to hear them. Um, so um, one of the first questions uh, that came up is talking about developing a structure for intercontinental mentorship training um, to mentor and train PICU nurses in low resource countries. Um, and um, Courtney Nerovich posted something about a system that she participated in. I don't know if everybody could see that answer. Um, one of the strategies that WIFPIX really strives um, to maintain is, in fact, part of our mission and vision is education for all members of the healthcare team throughout the world and um, creation of mentorship opportunities. I think that one of the things that um, Natasha brought up, though, is the issue that um, the needs of different locations um, varies. And so creating a mentorship program um, maybe um, is actually quite feasible. It actually may not meet the needs of the mentee. And so we have to be strategic in creating um, such opportunities. But I'm interested in hearing from anybody on the panel um, who has created um, such a mentor-mentee program and what their insights could be. Hi, Lauren. In our unit here at the Alberta Children's Hospital, we, we were struggling um, about eight years ago with really significant turnover. And I know Rachel spoke about the, the implications of that on patient care. And so we implemented at that time a formalized mentorship program. So each new nurse entering our PICU was assigned a specific uh, mentor nurse. Um, and the more senior nurses obviously volunteered for this. We brought in some external education to actually train those mentors. And I think that was actually probably the biggest learning for us is um, we all know mentorship is helpful, um, but I had never in my undergraduate or graduate nursing training had any actual formal education on how to be a mentor. Um, and so doing some formal mentorship training and then structuring that program as to what it looks like um, for those, both the senior mentor nurses and the new junior mentee nurses. Um, and that's something we've continued on since then and it's been really a successful program. Um, and those nurses provide mentorship, not only in like knowledge and skill acquisition within the ICU, but also resilience, um, partnership, friendship, and then navigating some of the unspoken clickiness of nursing that we all know can exist and navigating those uh, personal relationships we found really valuable. So I think our key learnings were formalizing the education for the mentors and really structuring a mentorship program. And because it existed within our unit, I think it overcomes some of those challenges when you have mentorship happening across um, diverse environments. That's great. Thank you, Lori. Um, and Karen Dryden Palmer posted on the chat that it's important to also um, have tools to be a mentee, which I think we oftentimes don't think about um, what it means really to be a mentee. Um, it's great to hear that you have that in your system. I'm wondering if anybody has any experience um, having mentee mentor programs across um, continents or borders. Hi, um, in our unit, we work with um, work with centers from China. So routinely, they will send their PICU nurses here for exchange program, and they stay on for about six months. So I would say, say as a exchange program. In terms of our neighboring countries, we do support uh, nurses in Myanmar. So we would sort of uh, adopt a hospital, and uh, we will pair with the uh, card the cardiac surgeons. So they will carry out um, surgery, cardiac surgeries there. Our nurses together with their nurses will nurse the patient's post-op. So these are the two initiatives we've had for the places in China and Myanmar. 
And then um, do those relationships progress beyond the six months or once they leave, they're gone? Or does the mentorship continue over time? When they leave, they are gone, but they will continue to send nurses here for exchange. Okay, great. Others? So, um... In relation to the European Society for Paediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care, we're just about to launch as a society a interprofessional mentorship programme that, that transcends across European countries. And really that's about trying to grow our cohorts of um, nurse scientists, clinical nurses, um, connect people and, and enable growth within our profession and within our specialty. Um, it's just about to be launched. So we've, we've had the executive committee for ESPNIC have um, written a proposal and some guidance in terms of reference in relation to how the programme will work and how the relationships will be formed and developed and what the expectations are of the mentor and the mentee um, and how they will be supported in those roles. So absolutely in relation to Karen's um, comment, it's about how do we build people to be mentors and mentees and understand the role and get maximize that um, but we haven't it, it's about to be implemented so we can you know hopefully touch touch base again in a year's time and, and feedback on that um, but we've I think there's an ambition and a drive to build connections um, you know work together collaboratively to try and um, lift as we lead um, and bring people on the journeys, impart knowledge and expertise and try and work together on some, you know, we have tremendous commonality in a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today, even if we do have geographical disparity. Um, so I think it's about building those connections and, and this, hopefully this scheme through ESPNIC and, and certainly the more localised schemes that have been talked about um, enable us to do that. That's a really great point, Joseph. And the Society of Critical Care Medicine has a similar uh, mentorship program within the pediatric section that um, really transcends um, disciplines that pairs nurses with physicians, physicians with nurses as mentee mentors. And I think that um, programming and, and putting team members together, I think is really important for our all of our professions. Um, because nobody operates in a vacuum. We operate together to improve the lives of children, um, regardless of our contribution, our specific role to the team. So I, I think that's a really important mentor and mentee um, program um, in general. It would be great to see that happening in the different societies around the world, all that are members of the WIFPIX Federation. So that's great. So we're going to move to one more question. Um, and the question um, was posed by Carla. What's the impression of the influence of workplace violence, patient to nurse, nurse to nurse, colleague to nurse, or family member to nurse on nursing turnover in, in our individual areas? So it looks like Rachel already posted an answer to that, that that's not very common nurse to nurse in her area. Is there anyone else who'd like to answer that question or comment on it? All right, I will take a can stab. I, oh I, yeah, Mavilde, go I, ahead. Yes, 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 I would like to. to First, I would like to thank for all the talks, incredible. We can see the difference that we have in equalities in uh, provision of pediatric critical care across the globe. I would like to say that in Brazil, we have a very nice program of pre nursing residents and multi-professional residents. And then this is the way we can uh, have nurses in PICU and EQ for a lifetime and uh, developing themselves. Uh, it's a program with a scholarship for the government and uh, six hours per week. It's not easy. It's a hard course in two years. And uh, I think that uh, Patricia was a nursing resident uh, in this program. And I think that it's, it's very good to retain nurses in PICU in low resources countries because we work with purpose. We work with uh, 
the preparation of these nurses. But according to the violence, yes, we are facing it and now with COVID-19, when we have our hospitals full of uh, people and uh, needing beds, uh, of for sure the population was uh, uh, believing that we were doing the best that we can, yes, as, as healthcare professionals, but uh, uh, we, we suffer violence and uh, many times, uh, not in internal violence, uh, conflicts, I say more, more with uh, uh, the healthcare team with different goals, different perspectives and raw resources. And uh, people want uh, to have healthcare. And uh, if you do not have provision, uh, the first one in the, the door is the, the nurse. <laughs> and so we have, um, it's difficult to know a nurse in Brazil that never faced some kind of violence for, for families and, and uh, from uh, the society, yes. Um, I also wanna add um, something about the workplace of violence. I wouldn't say physical violence necessarily, but when I first started um, in the pediatric ICU almost 11 years ago, it was a smaller unit, um, about 15 to 16 beds, and the philosophy then was the old eat their young. So I think that that really contributed to our nurse turnover rate because it was only, the philosophy was only the strong survive and you have to have really thick skin to work here and, you know, we're going to beat you down to then build you back up. And I think over time, it's really shown that that is not successful in building good pediatric critical care nurses. It's you know, to recognize the struggles and to guide them into the ways of taking care of critically ill children. Um, so I think that definitely was an issue when I first started nursing. So what I would say, violence, not necessarily, but it can definitely take a mental toll um, on you from nurse to nurse um, interaction. And um, going on the parent in RN, um, workplace violence. I, again, I don't think that it's necessarily physical violence, but at our institution, we um, have multidisciplinary rounds. So we always invite the parents to be a part of the care plan. And it's a big philosophy of our unit because again, the parents know the child better than anybody else. And they should be able to voice um, their concerns and they should be able to be an active part of their child's care plan. Um, but sometimes this can also be mentally and physically and emotionally exhausting for the bedside nurse because um, sometimes the parents can be a little bit overbearing or we can, you know, have disagreements on things that we think that should be done versus what the parents, you know, think should be done. So I think that really does take a toll um, on our nurses as well, just the mental fatigue of trying to do, you know, your work at the bedside, but then also having to deal with, um, you know, the parents as well. So we're not just taking care of the patient, we're also taking care of the patient's family, their caregivers. And I think that is not necessarily understood when you first come into this career is, you know, if I could just strictly take care of the patient, I can do that very, very well but I also need to take care of the family and answer all of their questions and help feel, you know, have them feel supported um, along the way and that they're just as big of a part as taking care of the child as the medical team is. Thank you, Courtney. Um, we have one minute to go, so we need to wrap up. I think the topic of family-centered care is incredibly important to the work that we do around the world. And perhaps that will come up again in managing um, professional burnout in our next conversation that we have on December 10th. For now, in the year of the nurse, I would like to thank all of your contributions. They really have been invaluable, all of your insights from around the world. I would like to thank all of our attendees for listening and posing questions that have um, created some very thoughtful conversation. And I would like to leave the group with one of my favorite Florence Nightingale quotes. So never lose an opportunity of urging a practical beginning, however small, 
for it is wonderful how often in such matters the mustard seed germinates and roots itself. Much will grow from this conversation today. So thank you for joining.